Uh, so hello and welcome to another episode of the ICC Academy COVID-19 Briefing, an interactive video series where we explore the economic and health implications of this coronavirus pandemic and what must be done to ensure successful recovery for businesses big and small. I'm your host, Thomas Paris, and in this episode, we will hear from international climate leaders about why climate action is still everyone's business. Joining us today is Gonzalo Minos, high-level climate action champion for COP25 Chile, with Chile, um, and co-founder and executive president of Tricy Club. We also will. Uh, we also have Nigel Topping, high-level climate action champion for COP26 with the United Kingdom, and our moderator is returning guest Majda Debagi, director for inclusive and green growth at the International Chamber of Commerce. And very soon, we will also be joined by Maria Mendeluce, CEO of We Mean Business and managing director of climate and energy at the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. I think she's running a little bit late, but we are going to be patient and wait for her. So uh, for those who already know, uh, during the session, we will start by running through a few pre-prepared topics, followed by an audience Q&A session. So we invite you to send your questions in the chat and we'll go through them together. So let's kick things off, Majda, over to you. Just remember to unmute yourself. <laughs> Great. great. Thank you so much, Thomas. Um, and welcome, everyone. It's really great to be here again. And um, so uh, pleased to uh, be able to to lead this uh, really what I hope will be a really uh, insightful discussion for, for everyone involved. So on behalf of all of our partners, uh, we mean business, the B team, uh, the World Economic Forum and World Business Council for Sustainable Development. I'm really pleased to welcome Nigel and Gonzalo and hopefully Maria as well uh, very shortly uh, to this webinar. Um, as you know, this year was supposed to be the super year for the planet. And uh, unfortunately, um, the international meetings, uh, policy meetings that were scheduled for this year on oceans, on biodiversity and on a climate have all had to be uh, postponed. And uh, for obvious reasons, and and so this webinar is really all about um, having a look at uh, why, in the face of, of COVID nineteen, climate action still needs to be everyone's business, and what we can do uh, in this time to first of all take stock of uh, the lessons that we have learned and will continue to learn uh, about the current pandemic, um, and also. Uh, think about how we're going to build resilience and be better prepared, especially as businesses, uh, for uh, future existential threats. And uh, also think about our recovery and how can we build a comprehensive recovery that addresses the many global challenges that we're facing right now from inequality and um, you know, job losses and uh, climate change. So I'm so pleased to be able to really welcome uh, Gonzalo and uh, Nigel here because you're climate advocates, but you're also uh, business leaders and um, we have a lot to learn from you um, there. So with that, um, we'll launch right into the discussion. I know uh, people are continuing to join us and many have sent in questions before, but I will keep an eye on the chat. Uh, as well and, and try to integrate those questions into our discussions as best as possible. Um, so um, I'll turn to you first, Gonzalo, if I can. Uh, so you're the Chilean climate champion. Um, and uh, thanks to you and your leadership and that of the COP25 presidency, uh, we launched uh, the Climate Ambition Alliance at the uh, UN Climate Action Summit um, about 18 months ago. And now you've just recently launched with Niall uh, the Race to Zero campaign. And this is, uh, it, it's really great to, uh, to be able to build on, on the efforts that you've, you, you've started and uh, continue that uh, together. Um, and so this is the Cl Climate Ambition Alliance. Many, many of our, our guests might not be very aware of, of what it is, but it is incredible initiative to um, uh, really bring all stakeholders around one common goal. So I was hoping to talk a little bit more about it and um, and tell us about the progress that you've seen and also some of the hopes that you have for the future. And I'm glad that Maria has just been able to join us uh, now as well. So welcome, Maria. Well. 
Thank you, Matt, and, and welcome, Maria. So good to have you also joining the panel. Uh, and, and thank you to ICC for the opportunity of having this conversation. It, it's really encouraging to see how many people are connecting from different regions of the world, because this is all about <clears throat> uh, connecting the efforts globally. We first, uh, we now, of course, acknowledge that we are going through very challenging times uh, i hope that everybody that is connected here is not only healthy but they're beloved are also safe and and going through this this crisis uh, in the better possible way uh we are people that are connected as well not only to the topic of the uh, let, let's say the, the the sanitary uh crisis but also how much of this is affecting businesses worldwide and and much of that is, is going uh, to affect and is affecting smes and 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 so many uh companies uh worldwide that will have to cross through this crisis and and we are seeing a, a great opportunity of connecting uh the the way to cross the the crisis in a in even a better way in a better way while connecting to the, this bigger crisis that we all still facing, uh, that is the climate crisis. So in that sense, uh, the first element to, that we connected when we uh, developed the, the Climate Ambition Alliance, and when I say we, of course, the Chilean presidency was part, part of it, but, but we, we have the UNFCCC, of course, the Secretary General with all his capacity, and, uh, and we have the, the UNDP as the main partners, but then, all of the coalitions, ICC, Women Business, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, the UN Global Compact, and many others, B Team, B Corps, many people connected in a single moment with just one single uh, focus, and it was the 1.5 degrees. That was fundamental. I mean, the, the, having the 1.5 uh, IPCC report in October 2018 allowed us to, in September last year, to say, okay, we have a very clear vision from the science telling us that it's all about working towards that goal of 1.5 degrees. In that sense, what we have to do is mobilize the world to achieve net zero emissions by 2050, the latest. Okay, that, so that, that was fundamental. It seems to be quite simple and quite obvious. It wasn't, okay, and, and, and I understand that for many people around the world, it's, it's obvious that, and we're saying now, how risky is not to follow science. Well. You have a lot of people that are sometimes reluctant to follow science, and that, that that's something that, that that we have to position. Because if you follow science, then you have to do what they're what you're told to do. And and I might there are people that say, okay, yeah, I understand science or I like science, but I don't like to whatever take the pills that the doctor is telling me to, uh, or or take the treatment, right? So, so it's all about what to do then. And in that sense, so we uh, we we have the the the, the capacity to deliver. A fantastic platform of radical collaboration putting so many efforts together all of them towards the same goal we had of course one one level was the parties right at that time uh, in in the in, in in the secretary general summit in september we had 66 parties joining that alliance then we have 83 businesses major businesses of course then 102 cities uh 12 major regions of the world and two billion of of dollars in uh, 22 trillion dollars in 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 investments uh, through the um through, through through the asset owners alliance we understood that that sample was fantastic to show the world that it was possible to put so many let's say different players all together toward the same goal we made that alliance grow towards cop 25 and in 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 in, 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 in cop 25 we announced a grow uh, that showed 121 parties, meaning 60 plus percent of uh, the, the, the parties of the world, still not the big emitters, but it was important to show that even uh, in between the, the parties, there was an intention of mobilizing for so many, I mean, the majority, right? But then we increased the number of, uh, of cities up to uh, 398, we increased the number of businesses up to 786, and we increased the number of uh, the amount of uh, investors at, uh, up to a, a $4 trillion. That increase, what I like to, to mention here, that was fundamentally being done by, of course, the parties was fundamental, but then cities and businesses, and when it comes to businesses, it was the moment while, when, when SMEs joined. And last Friday, 
we updated uh, the the numbers, and I would like then Nigel to mention much more about what's the the, the race to zero as a campaign. But we increased the numbers by sixty five percent, showing that now we have fifty three percent of the global GDP already committed to net zero emissions by twenty fifty. The latest that. It's major in terms of showing that even in the midst of the pandemic, we're talking about the last six months, and now having uh, 992 businesses, uh, 449 cities, uh, 21 regions, 38 investors, and then we we also included one new uh, category that's the universities. So so this is momentum being built in the midst of the world. Uh, greatest or, 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 or sorry that the biggest crisis that we have faced in the last century uh, and, and therefore it says um, an amazing opportunity and a sense of hope that we can reach Glasgow with a much uh, bigger commitment uh, and, and then yeah I, I would like uh, Nigel to, to announce what we are preparing for that because uh, it will now go and brings us to the role of the SMEs and how much we have to do with, uh, with ICC and also with Women Business and the World Business Council. Great, thank you so much, Gonzalo, and congratulations. There really is so much uh, momentum uh, being built, and it's really thanks to um, the leadership of, of, of you, uh, of Nigel, uh, of your presidencies. Um, Nigel, yes, I would love to hear. It's all about collaborating. Absolutely. So, so. Radical, the radical collaboration, absolutely. Um, and we're so glad to, to be a part of that and contribute. Um, Nigel, feel free to yes, add a little bit more about the Race to Zero campaign, but we're also really excited to hear from you about um, COP26 itself. Uh, it's really unique because the president, uh, well, first of all, it's a huge COP. Uh, it's a very important uh, milestone for the future of, of, of uh, you know, our climate action, um, but also really unique because the COP26 president is also the UK uh, business secretary and has been really at the heart of, kind of understanding how businesses need to respond to the COVID pandemic and, uh, and you know, wearing both those hats. Uh, I'm sure you, uh, you have a, a lot of uh, insights as to how business can engage and why they should engage uh, leading up to COP26. Great. Well, thank you, Madam. It's, it's great to follow on from from Gonzalo's um, energetic start. I must say that um, I feel really, really honoured to take this role at, at this challenging but crucial time. And it's you know, and it's great to um, you know, we have this we have this kind of fancy title of high level champions. But it, it, what we really think is what we need is like seven and a half billion champions. So this is a collective action problem that requires everybody to work. And and the great thing is we have. Um, in the non-state actor community, particularly in the business community, as you say, with ICC, with the World Business Council, with Women Business, we have fantastic partners. So, so the, 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 the most fun part of Gonzalo's and my job is just to applaud other people for great work they're doing. And then we and then we always ask people to add a zero to their um, to, to, to their objectives, as you know. We'll take 10 years off. Um, so what, yeah, what, let me say a little bit about, about COP26. Um, I mean, first of all, I think you're, you're, you're right that it's really, it's really great to have a incoming president is also the business secretary um of course that means right now he's very focused on the covid crisis and the and the and, and the economic issues facing particularly smes right so um uh, you know really pleased to be working alongside um alok sharma um, and supporting him and i think we'll see more and more of him as as the economy emerges from covid and, and the uk government along with many other governments seeks to um, ensure that it's a clean and resilient recovery uh, I think you know the, the the we're all very aware the UK presidency is very aware that as you say this is a big cop it's the it's the five year anniversary so in a way it's the test of the Paris Agreement and it's a big test for the multilateral system which has some headwinds at the moment so we're all very aware that this is a crucial cop and uh, and business has a crucial role to play um, I mean so in many ways. The, you know, the successful COP will be one that has people saying, yes, Paris is working. Um, and to do that, we're going to need to see a big increase in ambition on mitigation, so which is 
the race to zero, but also a big increase in um, in action on adaptation and resilience. You know, we've COVID has exposed a lot of the fragilities, um, in, in a lot of them structural, a lot of them are driven by inequalities between the global north and south or within communities. Um, uh, also, the delivery of some of the finance commitments that have been made. So, some of the enabling commitments. It's not. It's not just about commitments. It's about demonstrating action uh, across the, the board. But in terms of the role for business, um, uh, the UK presidency set five um, priorities out beyond the negotiating um, agenda, which needs to be delivered. And those those are um, sectoral broadly so i'll just i'll just name those so everybody knows so one is to really focus on the accelerating the energy transition that's particularly around the, the phase out of coal around the world because some of you may know that the um you know the industrial revolution started in the uk we've been burning coal more and more and more for um, a couple of hundred years now and and actually today at midnight we will hit two months without burning any coal it's incredible 10 years ago it's still like 40 percent. so it's really it's it's it feels like a miracle, but it's an interesting sign of just how fast whole systems can change as we build confidence and go faster and faster. Um, so that's so that's that's one um, priority of the presidency. The second one is um, the phase out of the combustion engine for cars. Um, some those of you who know me know it's my it's my it's my favourite subject. Um, uh, but again, we're seeing that accelerating. When we when we all woke up the the day after Paris, most people were thinking 2060, 2070. I think the IEA was saying we'd still be building lots of combustion engine cars that late. Now, of course, we have France and the UK then set 2040 phase out dates. Now we have Netherlands and Nordic saying 2030, 2025. UK has announced 2035, maybe as early as 2032. They're just consulting now. So one of those big campaigns is to try and make that global all, all major markets. Um, and we can see the role there of, um, of, of businesses and other non-state actors. If you see the the, the companies, the fleet owners committing to electric vehicles by 2030 and the retailers committing to investing in infrastructure and the, the kind of UPSs of this world and the Amazon recently saying 100,000 electric vehicles and of course cities with cities as diverse as Bogota and Paris all very clearly sending signals that um, there'll be no place for combustion engines um, and their city streets in 10 years time. The third one is around um, nature-based solutions but particularly looking at the, the forest commodities as we call them soy palm beef and timber and making sure that um, none of those are being produced in a way which is driving deforestation uh, and then there's a couple of cross-cutting themes finance with mark carney um, advising the uk presidency and, and prime minister as well as the secretary general and then adaptation and resilience is a really important agenda across across the world in those many communities that are already being impacted and, and as gonzalo says you know our kind of headline commitments as working with the non sector community to get to a massive increase in net zero, that's the race to zero, so 10 times as many commitments. And then also working more detailed at a sectoral level to build build momentum across all the different actors. And, and, and you know, Maria's um, launched some great work with the World Business Council you know, on this SOS 1.5, which we'll hear more about later. But so how, do we, how do we collectively share the roadmap to zero so that it actually de-risks it for everybody? So if we're all working towards the same phase out date for internal combustion engines, there's no risk for each car company, or the risk is the same for each car company, each oil company, each city. But if we're all competing on the trajectory, it, it relates a problem. So we're doing a lot of work right now. We'll be um, revising the net zero pathways, which Gonzalo and the Marrakesh Partnership published last, uh, last autumn. We'll be revising those and then using those as the basis for a lot of conversations and campaigns into, into, into November and next year. That's great. Thank you so much. Uh, it's Maria. Uh, yeah, congratulations. And and as we said, we are so happy to 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 be a part of all of this and and help uh, be part of this whole radical collaboration. And Maria has been doing a lot of great work both at WBSD, but also in your new role as CEO of We Mean Business. Uh, we Mean Business has been really uh, very actively behind uh, the. Um, 1.5 uh, campaign for for businesses uh, so the business ambition 1.5 as you can you tell us a little bit more about this the business ambition for 1.5 and about the sos um 1.5 uh, work that you've been doing 
Thank you, Martha. Thank you all. And apologies for being a bit late uh, at the start of the meeting. So the campaign has been, a, we think, a great success. It has been a collaboration between UN Global Compact, SBTA, SBTA and the Women Business Coalition uh, that, as you know, has seven partners from around the world, of which WBCSD, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, is one of them. I think it's it's fair to say as well that the ICC has been supporting uh, this and bringing uh, the SME community as well to this 1.5. And that uh, that in itself, it's a big accomplishment. And uh, if you think about the history and and you know from where we come from, the fact that all the big business organizations are supporting a 1.5, it's it's remarkable. And we just should um, you know congratulate Nigel mainly because he's been chasing all of us to do this for many years. But congratulate the many people that are behind that are listening to science because that's what business are doing now, and even more after COVID, they really realize that we need to listen to science. So it is a commitment that includes very influential and, and heavy emitters like Scania, utilities like Iberdrola, and household names like L'Oreal or Levis Strauss. So, so this is like fantastic. So 243 companies that have pledged uh, to limit warming to 1.5 degrees. And uh, there are 66 SMEs. And, 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 and it's really important that the SMEs are part of the journey. So I think uh, it, is, it is quite an interesting moment because uh, we have heard that, you know, it's not the absence of commitment. There's lots of commitment by cities, by business, by many actors. But now what we need to do is accelerate action because there is the 2050 goal, but there is the 2030 goal, which is to half emissions um, and in this decisive decade, and one that is starting with this COVID, uh, that is completely shaking the world as we speak. And so I think the business community, the big multinationals understand, you know, they understand they need to be aligned with science, and they're doing as much as they can to do so. They understand that there are many technologies available that can be deployed. And, um, and now the time is to move uh, from that understanding to implementation into the business strategy. So it's not about having a climate and ambition. It's just like, how are you going to change as a company your procurement practices? How are you going to reskill your workforce? How are you going to talk about these issues with your stakeholders? How are you going to engage your value chain in the process? And that's what SOS 1.5 is doing. This is, this is a report that was launched last Friday by the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. That is precisely, you know, looking at, okay, companies you have committed to 1.5, so how are you then going to move? So we did uh, 40 interviews, uh, in-depth interviews with companies that are in the journey to understand what is the process and the steps that they are taking to get there. And so this is also the start of a journey for WBCSD, moving much more to this strategy risk understanding and, and internal uh, strategies by companies and, and, and actions that companies need to do to get there. And um, and when and, and there will be three work streams that I, I want that will emerge from these activities. But what I want to talk is about the importance that we link to the real economy. I'm speaking and I'm sure the high level champions are speaking in many of these events and we're speaking in our bubble. And we believe, you know, and we all agree on what we're saying in this call. Uh, but the real economy is hit now by a, a very important crisis. And we need to bring a language that is attractive to it, especially for the SMEs, as you mentioned before. Uh, we think that the, now there is an opportunity for SMEs to reinvent themselves. I like the metaphor, if you your house is burned, you will rebuild it. And you will rebuild it taking what you liked about the old house but repairing the things that you, you knew that they were not working. So I think we are at that moment in time. And, um, and I think SMEs can see an opportunity on reinventing, changing the business models to be able to be aligned with what the big multinationals are aligning themselves to. And now what is important for our community is to help them do so, to help them on the how to do so. So SOS 1.5 is one of the tools, but there are many more tools that need to be tailor-made or SMEs. And that's a role that ACC can do brilliantly. And then finally, we need policies. 
So it is ambition, we need action, but we need advocacy. We need companies to, to talk and to be consistent with their ambitions when they talk to policymakers. And we'll hear more and more uh, companies speaking up. In fact, there were 150 of the companies that signed the 1.5 pledge that have signed a letter saying, yes, to governments, you know, we, we need to double down. We have heard that Boris Johnson yesterday say that the recovery must be clean and green. We have seen the green stimulus packages. But let's go and beyond those statements into actions. And let's put in place policies that can help the SMEs and the big multinationals implement these ambitious plans. So I think we have quite a busy agenda, all of us in the call and, and the audience. Thanks a lot, Martha, for the opportunity to present this. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, I think you, you helped to answer some of the questions I had around also, you know, how do we ensure that you know, we actually take action and, and achieve the commitments? Because 2050, especially for SMEs, is quite far away in some respects. So, and um, so how do we implement a strategy um, to ensure that we are on target, uh, you know, that we are having emissions uh, every decade, uh, the way the exponential roadmap, the strategy, for example, uh, sets out. Um, but on the SME question itself, uh, I'd like to get to that a little bit because, uh, of course, Gonzalo, you're, you're a small business owner um, in, and, uh, and you also led the B Corp movement uh, last year to set uh, commitments for net zero, but by 2030 rather than 2050. So congratulations, because I think that there's over 700 uh, B Corps that are committed to the Climate Collective. Um, and, uh, and Nigel, I know that there's, you know, we've been speaking a lot and uh, you're very much a, 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 about trying to get the rest of the, the you know, the real economy on board for climate action. So just wanted to hear from, from you all around you know, what the role is of SMEs and how we can also provide them with the tools to ensure the, the, the long-term commitment. Well, uh, I, I would say there are several aspects in which this is fundamental. And, and not only connecting to, to Maria's words in terms of how do we follow action. I mean, words have, have must be followed by action. It's, it's not only about a declaration. It's important. It's important the commitment, the pledge, but then it's all about the plan and and the and how to proceed, right? Uh, and and then uh, we we said the, that fourth uh, P that is about publishing, uh, being transparent. So all of that is fundamental, and we need to see and we need to show the world that that there are, there are so many. Uh, companies and, and then also uh, um, cities and regions that are doing the work already and, 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 and then start showing the world what in concrete are they doing. Uh, in, in that sense, we, uh, we perceive that it was really important to, set, um, to send a message about one particular example and, and, and we thought that B Corps should be one fundamental one due to the condition that they set environmental and social targets in the bylaws. So, so for them, it's absolutely critical uh, to be committed to the highest possible standards in terms of uh, environmental commitment. And in that sense, climate being one of them, uh, we decided to, to also position uh, the, the work of the B Corps around the 2030 agenda. So we also decided that it was important to, to send a message on how much B Corps and companies around the world, if they are saying that SDGs are fundamental, then they have to walk the talk. And, and, and in that sense, well, again, uh, setting a, a climate target by 2030 was one uh, fundamental one. And knowing, as you say, that, um, I mean, the highest percentage of, of B Corps around the world are SMEs. Uh, we have, of course, big multinationals like uh, whatever Danone or Patagonia or uh, I mean big uh, even big banks, but but most of them are are, are uh, SMEs and and therefore uh, the the messaging of yes it is possible yes there are so many uh, small and medium companies around the world in really different and I mean several industries that are capable of delivering their businesses and being profitable and at the same time uh, bring uh, this extra capacity to the world. That sets another element that is 
critical, and that's the ambition loop. The ambition loop is set for non-state actors to follow in this in the first case uh, the commitment by the Paris Agreement. And while non-state actors also follow them by committing, that allows parties, nationals, uh, and nations to increase their ambition, hopefully this year to the NDCs. But at the same time, when a company like whatever, Unilever or Nestle or BMW uh, or, or, or Diageo, if they commit, at the same time, they are creating another ambition loop with their value chain. And, and, and that is fundamental in the sense of what we're talking about. We have to also use that ambition loop, let's say uh, upstream, with the providers of each of those big multinationals that are committed. They have to send that message radically. So we also use the force that you, the ICC, and, and B Corp, and other platforms have in terms of saying to the SMEs of the world, this is a massive business opportunities. It's about what uh, Maria brilliantly mentioned about rebuilding your house in a, in a much better way. It's, it's like uh, reinventing yourself but reinventing yourself connected to those commitments that the your your biggest clients in many cases are already uh uh launching and, and saying to the world that that they need you uh they are not going to do it alone uh so so we have to uh, i think uh strengthen the role of the ambition loop on a political level in terms of the commit the the, the, the mutual work that uh, 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 states and non-state actors do, and the other side, the value change, and on the other side, the geographical activities that we have to strengthen when a region or a city also commits. So there are this, at least these three different ways in which I see the, the opportunity of the ambition loop being the greatest platform for the SMEs uh, to connect with the need of uh, re building back better. Great, thank you so much, Gonzalo. Yeah, Nigel, do you have uh, some words to add on that? I know you had to drop off, so you might have not caught it all. Um, to, 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 uh, uh, what's your message to SMB? Well, you know, I just I just checked some stats because um, you know we often talk about the big companies because everybody knows Rolls Royce or Nestle, so we had the CEOs of Rolls Royce and Nestle on our launch. Um, and and they, they do resonate with politicians and they do have a really important role. Right? But in the UK, 99.9% .9 of companies are SMEs. 60% of jobs um, are in SMEs and 50% of the economy is produced by SMEs. So, and, and, and so you can't have an industrial transformation, an economic transformation without that community, right? Um, and the other thing, you know, we know is that is that um, a lot of innovation happens in the SME community. They're often more 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 agile because they don't have such because precisely because they're smaller. They don't have they're not such big tankers. Right? They're more like kayaks where they one paddle stroke and they can change direction. So <clears throat> I think um, that for me is a really exciting thing about working with ICC and bringing. You know, so we need we need the multinational companies, but we need the ICCs, as, as, as Gonzalo says, in the value chain, it, in, innovating. Um, you know, all the all the disruptors. I just saw this morning that there's a little truck company called Nikola, which most people won't have heard of. They haven't produced a truck yet. They're, they have a market cap of 28 billion, so um, they have 250 staff. So by by that calculation, they're an SME, right? So um, so Tesla started as an SME. So 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 a lot of disruption is driven by SMEs as well, who go on to become um, much bigger companies. So there's, there's many, you know, many, you just, we just can't do this with a couple of thousand companies. Um, we need millions of companies. Um, that's, that's the main reason, Ashley. Yeah, that's great. And, and often we do hear that SMEs, um, you know, want to take action, um, but they don't often know how to or where to start. And so we're, we're hoping to, to work all together um, and provide these tools and the support and the incentives that SMEs need uh, to uh, be able to also make the commitments and uh, take advantage of the kind of the competitive advantage that will uh, uh, be garnered from 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 taking action, as you've pointed out. So that's really great. Thank you so much. 
Um, so we're getting a few questions um, uh, from from the from the audience uh, as well, from our guests. Uh, one of the questions is actually, well, what support is currently available uh, to SMEs to make the transition? So does anyone, one of you want to take that? Well, it's Nigel. Well, I think, as, as you said, Marcia, we're starting to see a lot of tools um, appear. I know that ICC are doing a lot of work, right? And the Exponential Roadmap, who you mentioned too, have already published a lot of tools. I know there are others at like Oxford University. I know um, at the business school there are producing a set of tools. So I think, um, I think we 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 sit, there are, there are other in the like in the food sector. There's an initiative called the the Climate Collaborative, which is in the kind of very much small organic food. They've done they've done a lot of work with some work with them at Women in Business a while back. So I think um, you know the work that you do will be really important. Um, but there are others starting to produce those tools and making them freely available, which I think is key. You know, making sure that there's there's tools which which everybody everybody can use without without having a big price tag on. That's great. Maria, you want to add? Yes, I, th I think there are, I was going to mention those tools, um, but I think what is important is now that business schools start to include as part of the curriculum in, in tools and, and, and better education around these topics, because I'm not so worried about the young, you know, the, the schools and even the, the people at university. But there is a knowledge gap for people, you know, that have not received this training, and so I think there is also an opportunity to for these business schools to to expand their projects. Um, and, and lastly, uh, uh, policy incentives are the best education tool for anyone. I think if um, if uh, with the COVID response, there are some specific measures that also you know provide some sort of conditional support linked to some actions on um, on climate, uh, I think we can go a long way because uh, that is a direct incentive for them to, to do something immediately. Um, if I can if I can add, of course, uh, it, it differs quite a lot from region to region. So each country has their own conditions on, on, on supporting SMEs. And, and even we have, uh, as I said initially, uh, 121 countries or, or parties is 120 uh, countries plus the Euro European Union uh, committed to net zero emission by 2050. In those countries, there must be some uh, different types of uh, tools that will support any company to 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 be part of this transformation and evolution towards uh, net zero. But then, um, as as Maria mentioned, uh, talent uh, is is one of the elements that is also helping companies to move a lot faster. Like we have seen how much uh, the, the, mostly the, the new generations, but it, some in, in many, many places and cases is not necessarily related to youth. It's, it's related to people that are needing to connect their talent, their capacity towards uh, a major uh, a major purpose. And, and in that sense, uh, of course, climate is, in many cases is, is, is one fundamental but then another one another uh incentives that we are working towards generating worldwide is the financial sector so once we strengthen the role of of the financial sector and 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 and, and the investors worldwide when they are saying i need to put my money for it in order not only for for it to be uh less risky more resilient but also uh, more profitable we have seen even in the in the pandemic crisis how much more resilient were the funds that were connected to ESG metrics than those that were not uh, so so we are totally committed and that's part of the work that we are doing with the climate champions team uh, to develop uh, uh, the conditions for the the financial sector to be the probably one of one of the fastest uh, uh, catalyzers of these uh, incentives worldwide while knowing that uh we uh, uh we we have to generate a market where money is moving faster and better while being uh, uh tracked by the need of of climate action uh and and and, and net zero emissions by 2050 the the latest 
Oh, that's all extremely helpful, and hopefully that answers uh, some of the questions. But clearly, there's a real need to kind of, uh, bring all of this together in a one-stop shop kind of uh, platform, um, and so that the the tools are available in a really uh, easy, user-friendly, uh, streamlined manner. And we're really hoping to to be able to to follow through on that and and provide that uh, to uh, SMEs worldwide. So thank you very much. So maybe if we just shift gears a little bit uh, to more of the, you know, how do we prepare for, for, for the future uh, as well? And the whole question around resilience, um, you know, especially SMEs, but all businesses right now have been um, really affected by the health and the socioeconomic implications of of the current pandemic and, and businesses are closing. Um, for SMEs uh, in particular, we know that 40 to 60 percent of uh, businesses that close during a crisis never reopen. So uh, it's you know it's devastating for for SMEs, but for the whole uh, global economy um, and for value chains uh, and, and and people. Um, so how do we? work to ensure that we are better prepared uh, for the future. Uh, and I know all of you have uh, a lot to say on this. And I always smile when I hear the word resilience because I remember at COP last year, um, Maria uh, boldly took the stage um, after an Article 6 discussion uh, that the room was, was packed and um, you know, everyone wanted to hear about Article 6, and Maria stood up and said, great to hear about Article 6, but what we really need to talk about today is resilience. And uh, I wish more people had stayed in the room. So uh, let, let's just uh, switch gears a little bit and and uh, hear what you have to say, each one of you, um, on how we can uh, build back better, uh, so to speak, or, or reset or uh, redesign, uh, whichever terminology you'd like. Thank you, Martha. So yes, I think you're right. <laughs> People then left <laughs> that meeting. But um, I think now everybody understands, many people understand now what, res what resilience means, which I think before the pandemic, not that many people knew. And one of the biggest lessons about building resilience for the, for the business sector is that actually the business sector can come back to normal operations quite fast. But maybe not the small companies, but in general, eh, we have seen this and we have seen how business has turned into work from home and, and different in different forms and can, can provide the same service. But the biggest issue that business has is that if society is not resilient, then they are not resilient, then they go bankrupt. And that's the situation that we are facing right now, that society you know, was not prepared and there is a tendency of ignoring what the science is telling us. So we heard uh, about the, the problems that the pandemic could bring to the world and the world didn't do anything. We have been hearing from IPCC over the, the you know, it's already the seventh report already about the, the problems that climate change can bring to societies. And, and yes, some people are hearing that, you know, if you look at, at the actions, not really. And then we also have heard that the WHO is saying that actually 7 million people die prematurely because of air pollution in cities, and we're not doing anything. So I think there is a tendency of not looking at problems at the eyes and saying, okay, well, this is a real problem. And then, you know, if we don't do that, then in a few, in a few months, in a few years, we might be back in this conversation and say, yes, Maria, remember when we spoke about it. So I think it is very important that the business start to integrate these risks into their company uh, financial reporting, following the Task Force on Climate Financial Disclosures recommendations. This is the only way that they can then understand the risk, uh, mitigate them, and also for the financial community to do something about it, because the financial community looks very closely at risks, and they will change the way that they allocate the capital if they understand the kind of impacts that this risk can have in societies, in economies, and in companies. So I think just to conclude, I think you know there is a moment, and now is the moment for companies to stand up 
and to, to, to show real leadership and look at the eyes of the problems that we face and, and confront them and do something about it. And we have already experienced, unfortunately, you know, the consequences of exponential impacts in, linked to some of the systemic risks. We don't want to come back to a situation like that. So, so we need to do more. So the best thing to build resilience actually is to mitigate emissions. And so that's what, what we should all be supporting. Thank you. Thanks so much. Nigel, do you want to add a little bit to that? Yeah, you know, I think about it, you know, resilience is our ability to handle surprises, right? So it's, it's really about how we meet the future. And, the, and so often it's a problem of a lack of imagination. Like we assume the future is going to be like the past, but maybe a little bit different. And, and the future, if it does one thing, it always surprises us. So I, I think... Um, I mean, when Maria talks about TCFD, part of part of the purpose of the, the, that, the recommendations of that task force was to force management teams to think about the future and think about almost go looking for possible surprises. Right? You can't predict all surprises, but you can say what what, what might happen. As Maria says, we all knew that a big pandemic was a possible surprise. Right? Um, now, maybe if you're an SME owner you don't um you don't need to do tcfd but you can still prepare mentally for surprises i tell you number one thing read more science fiction get out of the media that just tells us what's happening yesterday and read some of the amazing creative people thinking about how might society evolve it's not it's not all about spaceships and and, and, and guns right it's a lot of amazing people writing about how society might evolve look for early signs of change you know, don't just look for the big signals. If you if you think about um, you know this phase out of the internal combustion engine, it's been really obvious for a long time that it's coming. It's, the science tells us we have to do it, right? That, that there's something going on when Tesla's worth more than Jim and Ford put together. Um, when cities like London and Paris and Bogota start banning, so you can choose to ignore all those signs and say it's only one city or it's only two percent. But, you, but if you're thinking imaginatively about the future, it makes you much more resilient to what might come. This, in a sense, you've rehearsed the surprises somewhere in your mind. And the other thing I would say, and it's, I think, really timely now, is make sure you've got more diversity of views around the board table. You know, if you're all the same gender from the same school, from the same university, and from the same age group around the board table, you just built in fragility because you've got blind spots everywhere. Um, I was talking to one a board member of a, of a company yesterday said they, they've got a youth board so that every board member has a chat has, has somebody in the in the in the in their 20s in the company and they they, they they empower them to um not to not to shadow run the company but to explore certain topics and and share their perspective with the board so they're not waiting until they've missed the market opportunity to find out that that demographic has got a very different view of the world than they have so i think there's lots of things you can do, but it, fundamentally, you've got to put some time into thinking, imagining, talking about stuff that you are uncomfortable with, that you don't understand. But recognize that no one understands the future, so that's good preparation for um, meeting the future with resilience. So I want to jump yeah, from, from, and what, yes, uh, what, from, from what Nigel just, just said. I mean, make yourself uncomfortable is fundamental. I mean, allow yourself, allow your company to make the hard questions and, and try to answer them that's for free i mean sometimes it's just about being capable of answering or or or, or, or just mentioning those questions that are, are around uh and in that sense uh I, I can share my personal experience one like uh through through the beacon movement we have been uh, using the not only the tool of the b impact assessment as a tool for certifying it's a, it's a tool for measuring what matters like that the element of of the idea of making yourself the hard question and see what is your organization what are your 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 team and and, and yourself uh, answering to to the hard questions on uh not only uh what what i would do around climate but what i would do around governance how much of all of these 
elements of culture are embedded into the organization through the governance. It's fundamental in order to create an organization that really, really moves itself towards a much, uh, a much resilient way. Uh, and, and the other one is, is connecting to, to the SDGs. I think that is fundamental. Uh, we just launched uh, in January uh, this year the SDG Action Manager. It's, it's also it's for free. It's there. You can use it to see how much your company is really understanding the global agenda towards 2030 with all of these components that are so much related to what we are suffering uh, globally nowadays. Uh, so, so just questioning your organization through the SDGs, through the concrete practices, connecting to tools like the one that, that uh, World Business Council is developing uh, through the SOS. I mean, there are so many opportunities out there. You just need to have the attitude to, to be capable of uh, listening to those questions and hopefully being capable as well to find the right answer, uh, even though sometimes are going to be hard questions and hard answers. Oh, really good concrete advice, I think, from, from the three of you. And important uh, point to underline there, Gonzalo, with you know the, the need for a mindset shift, uh, essentially. So... Uh, we're getting a lot of questions still in the chat. I'm sorry we haven't been able to get to all of them, but uh, one question is coming in around uh, the COVID-19 recovery and the EU green recovery package. Uh, what do each of you think about the EU package and what are the areas uh, with room for improvement there? Maria, perhaps you'd like to take that question first on the EU uh, green recovery. Well, I think yeah, we're at the start of, of the journey of, of what uh, those plans will materialize in. But um, it's it's very it's a very strong message. The fact that twenty five percent of that funding is going to go to climate related activities, and I hope that other countries follow the same the same route. Now, I think uh, the the matrix that the policymakers need to do is to, to look at you know, what are the, the different investments, what are the, the job and economic impact that those investments can have. And I think if they do so, they also would see that uh, climate-related activities create, generate more jobs and generate more growth. Because that's what co countries need to do now. They need to invest, I, in my view, they need to invest in companies that are going to generate jobs and are going to uh, re-stimulate the economy instead of spending on, on, on certain uh, activities that have a short-term gain, but not a long-term gain. And so, so I, we see that, uh, that the governments are in the right uh, mindset. We need to give them ideas. We need to, to give them business voices that explain you know, the kind of things that now they can have the courage to put in place. Because it is when, when we are coming out of crisis, uh, when, when, when we need to show courage and, and, and move and, and reinvent ourselves. So this is a great moment to do so. Thank you. You're on mute, Master. There we go. <laughs> Thank you. I'm just conscious of the time. Um, good moderation. <laughs> Uh, Nigel, uh, Gonzalo, did you want to have anything to add on, on EU recovery packages uh, specifically? I, 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 I can I mean, We are seeing Nigel, here. Uh, as Maria mentioned, one of the elements that I would like to highlight is how fundamental is that signal for the rest of the world. So in, in regions like Latin America, we are t taking that into consideration in order to promote that type of decisions in this country as well. So, so that's a, a secondary positive effect not only in the region of, of Europe, but also worldwide. So thank you for that. That's great. Good, good, good. good. Uh, so yes, and, and, and clearly there's a real choice to make, you know, whether we lock ourselves into uh, uh, our past or lock ourselves into a future that is uh, sustainable and inclusive and addresses a lot of the systemic issues that we've been grappling with for, for a very long time. So just I think for the final question and before we, uh, we say goodbye and, um, and 
get a chance to hear a special message from ICC's chair and the chair of, of many of the organization with whom uh, we've partnered today. Um, just very quickly, maybe around Robin, each of you, just a, a quick 30 seconds to say, you know, what is the one action that you hope that businesses uh, take, whether they're multinationals or an SME here listening today uh, or listening to the recording uh, later? What's the one action that you wish that they take after uh, listening to this webinar and, and all of your insights? So, Nigel, we'll start with you. Sorry, yeah, sorry, go ahead. You're on mute, Nigel. <laughs> sorry, I was make a loud public commitment. Tell all your staff, tell all your friends, tell all your family, tell all your customers that you're going to the zero carbon economy um, at, at a date as early as you possibly can set. Great, Nathan. Maria. So my, my dream is that we end this and then you 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 stand up and you leave your computer and you go and do something. So actually, uh, that you're inspired to, to make the changes that you need in your business uh, to, to, to actually move into action and, and to do something about it. Uh, that, that would be a dream. Yeah. Great. So absolutely Great. adding Make to a what, commitment. Take action. Adding to what Nigel and, and Maria just said and try to go very concretely to say, uh, incorporate clean air and clean water into your uh, metrics of success on a monthly basis. Great, uh, important message there as well. So, well, I want to thank you all so very much um, for joining us, uh, Nigel, Gonzalo, and Maria. As I said at the outset, it's uh, really incredible to have a a group of people who are a climate leader, but also business leaders. And uh, it's been incredibly informative and I'm sure everyone's really enjoyed the webinar. So just like to thank also uh, all of our partners, uh, We Mean Business, uh, WBCSD, the WEF, uh, B Team, will be working together and, and collaborating together in the lead up to, to COP26 and, and supporting the race to zero uh, however we can. Um, and it's a real honor to uh, be part of that journey with you. So thank you very, very much. And we'll now turn it over to a really special message from uh, Paul Pullman. Thank you very much. Well, hello, everyone. I'm sorry that I can't join you today, but I wanted to share this message of support for the work that you are doing. As we all know, the COVID pandemic is testing our resolve like never before. And in many respects, it has raised the bar on what it means to be a responsible business. I'm not at all surprised to see the business community broadly playing a positive and constructive role. With many great examples of firms putting partnerships and purpose at the heart of their response to protect indeed lives and livelihoods. Whether that is consumer goods manufacturers producing hand sanitizers, the fashion industry making masks or the pharma companies working together on a cure or the many companies making sure that people have a social safety net. These companies have deservedly won praise and loyalty for their actions. And so does the ICC, which has been working around the clock with the multilateral organizations like the WHO, WTO, IMF, OECD, UN and the World Bank and many others to ensure that medical equipment is available, that people are protected, that funds are raised, that borders are kept open and especially the small and medium-sized enterprises protected. If this pandemic has taught us anything, it's that our existing model of economic growth is critically flawed. For too long, we've been prioritizing economic growth at the expense of our people and planet. But we've learned that we cannot have healthy people on an unhealthy planet. Accumulating financial capital became for many the sole objective, which human and natural capital largely overlooked and ignored. If we've learned anything from the crisis is that we need to urgently redesign our economies to make them even more sustainable and inclusive. 
Now, fortunately, more and more companies are embracing the longer-term multi-stakeholder models of growth, making them more resilient and prepared for the emerging post-coronavirus economy. I would argue that now is the time to double down and turbocharge this better way of doing business, not least as the jobs of tomorrow will be built off the foundations of a clean energy transition, of circular models of production and consumption, of sustainable food systems and end use, and the deployment of smart technologies that improve our connectivity and mobility. Study after study shows that there are simply more jobs, better paid jobs, more resilient jobs in this greener future. In all this, we especially must not lose sight of our looming climate emergency that makes the pandemic look like a dress rehearsal. Here again, the ICC and its members deserve huge credit for the work that they are doing to make climate change everyone's business. That's exactly the kind of action that we need now. Governments need to know that businesses are even more committed to bold climate action. I want to thank you again for everything that you are doing and above all, stay safe and healthy. Thank you very much. All right, so thank you Majda once again. So I know that some of our speakers had to drop out. Uh, so I'm just gonna close out the webinar real quick for those who are still with us. So uh, thank you for your time. As a reminder, we are hosting live broadcasts on this topic. Uh, in addition to other trade topics like the Incoterms rules, cryptocurrency, leadership coaching, and many others, uh, including, one to, um, including one on sustainability with Bertrand Picard, uh, the first to complete a nonstop balloon flight around the globe, but once again, hosted by Majda. So we recommend you check that out. Um, so sign up on our website for free and please subscribe to our YouTube channel. And ladies and gentlemen, this wraps up another episode of the COVID-19 briefing. See you next time. Thank you.